so we're kind of shift gears now. We, we've talked a lot about Tennessee specific and then their new um, new laws around facts, findings, and conclusions. Um, we started to get into preparing for your case. And Connie was talking about making it personal, making the judge know your child. So let's roll it back to the start. So someone walks into your office. Where does the preparing of the case start? Where's the first place you go? Yeah. So, and I will say a lot of people, you know, when they come to an attorney's office, you know, it's like going to the dentist's office with a toothache. It's like, it's not a fun place to be. So, you know, the, one of the first things you do is want to get a comfort level. And, you know, I try, I want people to be comfortable. I don't come in. I'm not boisterous. I'm not, um, you know, I, I a lot of attorneys are, are just kind of egotistic and want you to just think they're the big winners. I really want you to feel comfortable because you're going to have a journey. And, and I, you know, I, I started my law practice, I say as cousin Connie, because it was a great place to talk, but then immediately you need to start identifying. I allow somebody first to just talk. And I say, you know, you start talking and then I'll ask you questions. And so I just let them to start at the starting point that they want to start at. And that's very telling because there are a lot of times and, and the first part of the show, I spent a lot of time talking about personifying your child. Okay. So that's very, very important. It's, it, you know, we cannot be blind that we know a very, another part of the case that's very, very important is knowing how you need to respond to the attacks on you and what kind of attacks you need to make on the other parent if you do need to do it. And if you is such as if there is substance abuse by one party or the other, you need to know how to defend it. If you've had your own history of substance abuse and you need to know if the other uh, parent has substance abuse in their history and you need to know how what kind of evidence you're going to have to have to present it. I mean, I find that the, a lot of the contest between parents, although there are some substance abuse issues, and I take those very serious. A lot of the contest between parents, once they get in the courtroom, are just disagreements about the parenting style that they did, and that becomes an absolute tug of war. One parent is more of a free parent who, you know, wants the kids to go out and play, and the other parent is like a, you know, hyper protective parent. And then what happens, and this happens a lot to dads, I'm just going to say, you have this hyper protective mom, and she walks in the courtroom, and all of a sudden, everything dad does is dangerous, right? He takes them out for campfires. He, you know, he takes them, taught him to ride a bicycle on a public street. I mean, it's like everything becomes like life threatening when it's not right. So if, if a dad is more of an open dad of more wanting children to experience life, they need to be prepared and they need to be set up to know how to respond to that kind of attack. Because if she gets to go first, and she starts talking about what a horrible, unsafe father or parent you are, you need to know how you're going to address that and talk about it. So from the very beginning, you want to, as an attorney, you want to kind of identify what those issues are going to look like. What are the issues that ultimately are going to have to come out in court? Now, as soon as you start determining issues, you start determining evidence. And evidence uh, you know, has to be either certified records, witness testimony. You can't have letters. You can't have a piece of paper from your dentist. You know, you can't have a report card, <laughs> although we do use report cards. But, you know, you have to have good evidence. I also have people record and videotape, especially if they tell me that there are conflicts in the exchange, then they need to have a videotape of it or a recording of it. You just have to these days. And even before we all had cell phones with video cameras on it, I had a dad, I had a, a case with a mom and a dad. They were not married, but a child was about two or three. And mom's testimony was every time he comes to pick her up, she screams, right? She screams. She doesn't want to go. She screams. I told my client, I said, you're going to get a $20 recorder. You're going to put it in your front pocket. You're going to turn it on. When you pull up to her house, you're going to walk up to the door. You're going to knock on the door and then you're going to walk out. Well, I mean, I had a 30 second video or audio that showed as soon as he, she opened the door to the house, a little girl was going, daddy, daddy, daddy. 
Okay, so I've won a case on a 30 second audio before. You have got to show that. I mean, I've it gets kind of gruesome sometimes, you know, or kinds of maybe some people even call it kind of sleazy. But I mean, people have put up videos now, uh, cameras in their house. You know, I had a case where a woman told me her husband was drugging her and she put up an in-home camera system. And sure enough, he was in the kitchen drugging her glass of wine. So you have to think of how am I going to prove that to the judge? Otherwise, they're just, you know, they don't know who to believe once you get into the courtroom. Yeah, definitely. I thought you made a really good point in terms of preparation and strategy. I always use a football analogy. So you have to scout yourself where you're going to be offensive. And you also have to self-scout where you're going to have to defend things. And you and your attorney then need to, in turn, scout the other party. Where are they probably going to attack you? Where are they? What? How are they going to be defensive? How are they going to – where are their weak points? That's a big part of the case because I see it over and over again. Guys come in with loads of what they call evidence – and it's just too much for the judge. Mm-hmm. Like we need to pick and choose. Like you can't run every play in the playbook in the case. Like right. we got a game plan and we got to pick the right plays to win the game. Mm-hmm. So some of the, some guys that come in and they're like, I have 1000, like pictures of the kids and that makes it personal. That really, that there's not a lot of detail in that. That just makes it very personal. But when you come in with all of these detailed text messages and reports and all of this stuff, it can get convoluted where if you can pick the right four to five plays and really highlight those pieces of evidence, that's what will stick in the judge's head. Well, and and I'll say um, because these days there are we do have the ability to get a whole lot more evidence because of cell phones and text messages and emails. I mean, we have a whole lot more documented than we did years ago. There's a couple of things. And one of them is I develop uh, the themes of the case. Right. So the theme of the case, let's say, is like she's always canceling a visit, you know, 20 minutes before I'm supposed to pick my child up. So we might have you know, but if it's text messages, because I, because I, as an attorney, I don't want the other side to call what's called the completeness doctrine on me as far as lack of completeness with text messages. So we may indeed download 70 pages of text messages, but then I convert them to PDF. I page number them. I provide the page numbered copy to the other counsel. And then I go through with my client and I say, I'm going to hand you this. You're going to identify it. We're going to mark it as an exhibit as the complete communication. And then I'm going to say, turn to page 25. And then the judge knows exactly where to go. Turn to page 25. What day is it? What happened? What does she do? Look at page 37. What happened? What does she do? So I want to develop my themes, which may mean these days I have more of a bulk of of evidence, but I have it streamlined for the judge. The other thing that I do a lot, we have a rule of evidence in Tennessee called 1006, 1006. And the 1006 rule of evidence is a summary. So if you have, again, 70 pages of text messages, you as an attorney, you can just prepare a cover sheet and you can on that cover sheet, you can say page 25, you know, September the 25th, 2020, 20 minutes late at the visit, you know, and you can just sit down and you can list it. That way the judge can look at the summary. Your client can look at the summary and can just testify right from the summary. And then you hand it in, you mark it for the judge. You've you've got everything streamlined. You have your theme developed. The exact same things on medical records. Let's say one parent is the parent who is more active in taking the child to the doctor's office. You have to, if you have to, for completeness, present that whole record, you can then do a 1006 summary. And I use 1006 summaries a lot where you go, okay, these are the medical records of Dr. John Joe. Uh, These are the dates. These are the reasons the child went. This is the parent who took the child. And then your client can just boom, 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 testify on top of it. Now, when it gets to, again, that developing the themes and the issues, what I will sometimes ask my client, let's say I'm representing dad, I will say to them, what is she going to say about you? I'll just ask them directly. And, the, you know, a lot of times when I ask a client that, you know, they kind of get big eyed and, and go, well, uh, she's going to say, uh, but I'm like, I want to know what you think right now today she's going to say about you. So 
very, very important to, um, I develop chronologies and I develop themes. So I wanna know a chronology of things that happened. And because I tell my client as well, I says, when we go, when I start this case and I do an opening statement, I'm gonna talk about the themes. I'm going to talk about you're the parent who does this. You're the parent who does that. I'm going to kind of set the stage about how you're going to be attacked during this. When I'm presenting the evidence, I want to take it through chronology for the judge so the judge doesn't get lost because this is a this is something that a lot of attorneys on the other side who have really weak cases, they like to confound the facts by like not giving timeline so that the judge can't make any association of anything. So the judge is just like hanging on bits and pieces of evidence and, and not really getting the things like, you know, they may say, uh, uh, one spouse may say, well, his family never comes to visit. Right. And then, you know, but the truth may be that maybe three members of his family had COVID, right. Or something. So, so you want to make sure that you have chronologically developed your case. And then when I, before a client leaves the stand, we sum up the themes, you know, and so you go back to your themes, which basically your themes are the factors in custody. So if you have a factor in custody that says um, uh, better, uh, or, you know, providing care, day-to-day -day care for the child, then you have that theme. If it's extended family, you have that theme. If it's fostering the relationship with the other parent, you have that theme. So those are your themes from my perspective, but they're also the conclusions of law that you want the judge to reach. Yeah, re really good points there. So want to want to make sure we're clarified on you talked about putting in 70 pages of text messages and going to specific messages. This isn't entering 70 pieces of evidence. That's probably not going to be very effective. Having those large volumes in one exhibit also can keep the other attorney away from where exactly the case is going or what arguments you're going to make. So big difference between putting in 70 pieces into evidence and it gets convoluted, it gets messy and entering one large document that you already have marked and you already know where you're going to go. That could be more effective than just doing a single screenshot because as opposing counsel, when you get a single screenshot, even if it's able to get into evidence, you know pretty much exactly where they're going to go with that piece of evidence and you can game plan for that. If well, and, good. And, and not only that, but I, I mean, in today's world, you, especially text messages, you have to be very cautious because text messages are often cryptic and often are a continuing conversation, you know, so you have to be very careful. There is a rule of evidence called the completeness doctrine. And if you pick one single text message out of a whole scroll of a text message conversation, if you do that to me as an attorney, I'm going to object on the completeness doctrine. And I'm going to say, if you can't sit here today and present, it's like taking an audio and doing, you know, 30 seconds out of a four minute audio. If you're not willing to present and have that whole audio available for the other side, which of course we always have to exchange them in advance. So, you know, it's the completeness doctrine can really mess you up on text messages. I've seen that happen. And, and, but I will also say this about tons of evidence because I also tell my clients, look, you pay me a lot of money for every minute of my time. So it's very important to me that whatever evidence you have, that you put that evidence together. So if there are apps to download text messages, so you need to download your text messages with audios. If they come in with, you know, a flash drive full of audios, I say to them, I am not going to listen to 80 hours of audios. You can't afford for me to listen to 80 hours of audios. I don't know what's going to be effective. Let me tell you what I'm looking for. And then you identify where they are. Now I have found, and I don't know if you have used this mark, but there's a really good, I use rev.com. There's another one called otter.ai and they're really good uh, resources to upload audio files and get a transcript of it.
and they come back a little bit choppy. There's a little few inaudibles because they're probably doing it in India or something, but you can take regular conversations and get them transcribed and it's only like a dollar a minute and your client can even do it and then your client can listen to it. Your client can make the corrections in it if they need to. So, so you know, when, when I say prepare your evidence, I'm like, identify what your evidence is, you know, tell me why it's important once we develop what the themes are. And then the, 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 the parent has to prepare that evidence and get it ready because it is so expensive. I mean, for an attorney to be in a courtroom, it's $2,400 a day easy. So, you know, you can't, I can't spend six days preparing for one day in court. Uh, you just can't do it. That's the best way for, if you have an attorney, the best way to save money is to bribe them with organized information. Mm -hmm. The minute you drown in an attorney in 14, 15 emails of random screenshots and pictures and audios, just know that's, if they go through all of that and they have to piece it all together, they have to piece the timeline together. They have to figure out where things are. That's time. And that's right. yeah. we don't, we don't, we aren't working for free. So the no. best way you can effectively use your attorney's time is if you provide organized information. Let your attorney drive the strategy. That's our job. We, we're going to understand how these cases work, what the best angle may be, what, what the play that needs to be ran. And then you provide us with that detailed, organized information. And then we can plug it right into the strategy. And it's going to be most effective. It's, gonna, it's not going to frustrate anybody. And it's going to save you money. Mm hmm. For sure. And so while we're talking about evidence, let's talk about bad evidence, yes. because I have had clients come in <laughs> with a conversation with their with their co-parent. And, you know, well, she said this and she said that. And I go, OK. All right. So I like listen to it. And like they both sound really, really bad. Right. It's like you go like there is no way I am playing that in the courtroom. I'm just going to tell you now. I mean, neither one of you better be putting that on because the judge will kick you both out of the courtroom. So, you know, there is, there is such a thing as bad evidence. And so be very careful. And once you have engaged in, uh, uh, you know, I mean, when you're sharing custody, I just have to say, you just have to be on good behavior. I mean, we just got to do it. You just, I don't care how much you hate the other person. I don't care how much grief they've had, they've given you, you know, you've got to be on good behavior and you cannot lose your cool and you don't need to be writing emails in all capital letters. And, you know, you don't need to be telling your co-parent that, you know, her mother was always a bitch to you. And, you know, you, you got to, you know, you, if we need a whole training course on that, perhaps we do, but you know, you, you have to co-parent, you have to co-parent and uh, you know, we, I, there's bad evidence. So don't get caught in bad evidence. Hey, I, t I tell clients that if you're going to send a written message, it better be uncomfortable to send because you're being so obnoxiously nice because I yeah. guarantee you one wrong word, all of a sudden, the opposing counsel is going to be waving that and saying he's threatening her. He's frustrated. He's angry. So before you hit send, you better be uncomfortable with how nice you're being to your co-parent. Well, and I say this. I say before you hit send, read that email out loud like it's being read by a judge in a courtroom and see how it sounds. And then if it sounds OK, then you can hit send. Yeah. Yeah.